Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Russ with rwgresearch.com. Today's date is 2-14-2017. 2 14 I'm sorry, 2018. I'm a year behind. What do you expect? I have no idea if you're going to be able to read that. It's pretty small. <clears throat> I may have to crop this footage in or something. But anyway, um, so I want to talk about the search for answers. We press forward. I missed uh, this weekend's video, so I apologize, but life is what it is, and I can only do so much, huh? Really quickly, though, let me show you. So these are old bearings from one of my... Uh, the focus won't focus because I've got it focused manually, but anyway, these uh, these big bearings are for the, uh, the big build that I'm slowly getting together here. Those are full of grease and nasty junk, and I cleaned them out. They're Good enough for what I'm doing. I put some light synthetic oil in there and off we go. Um, anyway, a little out of time working on that project. But today I want to talk about okay, something that many other people have actually expressed in a different way. <clears throat> Most of them in their own opinion. Um, I'm going to give some references here even though they may make no sense to you. But uh, persons like Steve and uh, persons like... Um, um, well, there's a few other people, Tesla himself. Um, these ideas of using a pancake coil or a bifiler wound coil and some of the things that are going on with that took me a while and I finally wrapped my head around the understanding of how to apply that. So that's what this video is going to be about. I'm going to express to you my viewpoint on how we can apply the bifiler winding topology into things such as Newman's coil because they really do relate to that and we're going to do some experiments so I can show you. So we're going to talk about it first. Um, I have no idea what colors are going to work but um, I got some new markers. Hopefully you can see this. So this is the way you typically draw a non-polarized capacitor. Okay so this would be for uh, sinusoidal waves um, and it's basically Two plates, right? Well, I gotta ask a question, okay? If I just have two parallel wires, I should basically get the same thing, right? We've talked about some of this stuff along the way, but not in this viewpoint. And so, two parallel wires are basically two capacitors. Uh, the, the thing is, is there's not much surface area. So how do you produce a lot of surface area? Well, you wrap them together. Okay, and you end up with a coil that has a lot of surface area between the windings. So you build in capacitance. Now, if you just have a single coil, right, then you're relying on the, the capacity, right, um, between turns, like I've showed you in the past, which we talked about Newman's coil having a lot of internal capacitance just due to the fact there's so much wire on there but it's not wound in by filer on my big coil, okay? That's not by filer, it's single wind. So we're only dealing with a little bit of capacitance. But what the big coil does have is it has two very large, equal sized, uh, equal length windings, okay? And so what you get is you basically get that pretty decent amount of ca capacitance. And I have not measured the capacitance like this. I've only measured the capacitance like this, right, and found the self-resonant frequency of this coil, okay, is somewhere around 120 hertz. That's a little high. It's probably 118, 115. But the capacitance uh, for my memory was around 450 picofarad, okay? That's not much. It's actually pretty small. Um, if you try to charge this up like a capacitor, and try to discharge it like a capacitor, you have a pretty high resistance because of all the wire that's in there. Because the wire, in this case, is still where you're discharging, right? Here you're discharging through the winding, right? This is where you're discharging at, or through the wire, excuse me. Here you're still discharging, you know, basically there's a little bit of capacitance between these windings. Same thing here and here. So you're actually discharging through the wire, and in this case, uh, you know, it's one coil, it's a little different, but here you literally, literally have two um, coils with capacitance between them. So when you discharge them, you can actually discharge them like this. This being a, a load. 
probably writing this really tiny and it's going to be really hard to see, so I'm going to have to kind of zoom around on the screen. Um, so basically, um, the question becomes something a little different, a little different viewpoint. So normally, a coil is designed and used to generate a magnetic field, um, you know, to do different things, to use it as a pickup from magnetic interference. Whatever the case may be, you usually associate a coil with a magnetic field, right? A solenoid, um, you want to drive a permanent magnet motor, you know, you want to generate a magnetic field to do something with it, right? Normally, okay? I guess I'll leave that stuff on the board. I got plenty of whiteboard now. So usually, right, you, you normally use a coil to make a magnetic field, but in this case, a bifiler coil, or a bifiler wound coil like this, um, in my case I've got two separate coils. Here you've got like two individual windings wound next to each other. And so you have a lot more capacitance here, right, between this winding and this winding than you do between uh, these two because I'm only using the surface between the two coils. But in my demonstration that we're going to do here on the bench, it's like this. But this is even uh, better, obviously, for, for the, the more surface area you get here, the higher the capacitance is going to be. So the question becomes, um, and I brought this up in one of my last videos, and there was a bunch of comments, and people were kind of confused and having a hard time with it. But basically, think about it like this, okay? Um, if you have a moving magnetic field, right, like a permanent magnet moving past the coil, and the ends are open, you don't really see any resistance there, right? You can just whoop, and there's really no resistance, right? Magnet will just go right past the coil with no real interference with the coil at all. I can show you on the big one. We can spin it, and the thing is open coil, and unless it sh shoots an arc across there, it'll just be happy like that. So you can generate, but, but if you measure the voltage at the end of the wire, there is a voltage there, right? So the magnet induces an EMF, right? It really produces a potential at the end of the wires. So you can measure it, and as long as it's open, it doesn't interfere. So the question becomes really simple. Can you generate a potential in a coil that you can use, right, without causing drag on the magnet making this potential? Well, then you can ask yourself, once you figure that question out, okay, think about that for a while. Okay, the question, the, or the yeah, the question is, can you generate, all right, a voltage in a coil without dragging down the magnet with an open-ended coil? Sure, you can, right? Has nowhere to go across, so it can't make the loop, so it doesn't produce a magnetic field. There is a little small magnetic field in there. I will caution you. Um, I know that from my own tests, but in a small coil, you'll probably never see it. In a big coil like this, I can actually see that the that the flow to get that actually produces a tiny little bit, but not much. Not much at all, considering. So the question becomes, if you take a coil, such as this bifiler, and you end up making it react more like a capacitor, right, then the question is pretty simple. Can you charge the coil like a capacitor without having hardly any resistance to the magnetic field because you're storing the potential in a dielectric field. Okay, I don't like electric field, I like to say the dielectric field. Dielectric field um, is the opposite or the the hand in hand of a magnetic field. You can go from magnetic to dielectric. Dielectric is a real thing. When you have a circuit like this, the, the electric field, which I don't like that word, I like the dielectric because they change some things along the way. If you go back in time, you'll realize they call it the dielectric field. And the dielectric field is actually in between, right, these, this circuit at all times, but you don't even see it. So it's in there. Um, and in this case, we can actually, and I'm going to demonstrate what I can with this coil, I can actually charge, right, if I remove this, this load right here, okay, I can actually charge this coil right, and this will have a, a positive voltage, and this will have a negative voltage. And it'll, it'll have a negative voltage uh, only depending on how the magnet is oriented. 
Now, if I put a diode in here, which is probably what I'm going to do, if I put a diode in here, okay, then at this point, I can produce a little bit different effect because I can actually keep this from going the wrong way and actually store this potential in here. If I don't use a diode, I can only charge it on a half cycle. But if I use the diode, then I can charge it on a full continuous revolution. I only need one diode to do that, and we're going to demonstrate that. Now, I can always add a capacitor out here. But what I found in my testing is when you add a capacitor out here, because it's a much bigger capacitance than what's in between these windings, I don't get the same effect. That's why I was saying, when you add a capacitor versus using the windings as a capacitance, depending on how big the coil is and how much capacitance it has, if it has a small amount, it's easy to charge. So there is a tiny bit of, of current flowing in places that generate a negative effect. But if, if it's at 90 degrees, right, think about this. If a wire is like this, and a magnetic field is generated like that, and you put it in a coil, and a magnetic field is generated through the middle like that, and you can polarize that, right? One is a north and a south. If it's rotating, you can follow that direction, right? The right-hand rule. Um, but what's interesting about this is if you have two plates, okay, and you have current rushing in the plates, current movement will generate, right, this magnetic field, okay? That little bit of current that's moving to charge these two plates will generate a little bit of magnetic field. And so this scenario, if done in the right geometry, can eliminate some of that. I don't have the perfect geometry right now for you, unfortunately, but I can see how putting things in the right place would create the right effect because what you want to do is you want to charge this up like a capacitor. Okay, this kind of goes, goes back to the, um, a lot of research I've done on uh, Jim Murray. Okay, a lot of this falls back into that category where you're talking about quarter cycle phenomenons. All right, so if I have uh, been using blue, let's try something different. This pink, believe it or not, shows up really nicely. Okay, so I've got this AC sine wave. All right, I've got the positive side and the negative side. Uh, this right here represents the induced uh, EMF into the coil, okay? So that's the induced EMF into the coil. I'm not sure if green shows up. So what we want to do is look at this in quarter wave cycles. Okay, we want to look at the peak of the wave. So if a magnet is passing, right, if this is a, uh, if this is a magnet moving this way, and there was a, a coil of wire here, I guess I should draw the coil on the bottom. But if there was a coil of wire here, um, let's draw it right here. Okay, as this, as this moves into this coil, and then we're just talking about a general coil here, not any of the configurations I've been trying to express, which is important with Newman stuff. Um, but in a general coil, just a regular coil, the magnetic field moving here is going to produce a voltage at these terminals, okay? And it's going to generate a voltage at these terminals, and then as soon as the magnet gets here, it's going to continue on. And that would be like a general scenario where you're trying to generate something with this coil. So as it's moving into this coil, it's going to produce a resistance, right? And a counter EMF, right? This induced EMF is going to cause a counter EMF, okay? And if this first part of the cycle, okay, here we've got... Two coils configured like this, where you're charging them up, and then in this part of the circuit, the coils were configured in a different way. Let's say there was a uh, resistor or a light bulb or even just a dead short. On this part of the cycle, right, as the uh, as the magnet is moving in, we don't want this counter EMF here. But on this other side of this cycle, 
we would like to take the charge, right? Think of it as a capacitor like this, and we want to dump it across the winding and also into our load all at the same time. So here we're producing, okay, a charge between the windings and producing a dielectric field, not a magnetic field. So we don't get a counter reaction here. But on the second part of this cycle, or a quarter cycle here, we connect this in such a way where this is, uh, this is current flowing one way up to the peak, and then technically um, the current is still flowing in the same direction here, depending, well, depending on the coil configuration. But I won't get into that right now. Let's just talk about it like this for a second, because it all depends on your configuration. But in this case, we can charge this coil up and then we can discharge this coil and produce a magnetic field. Um, I'm not even going to draw these things on here. So this simple thought process can bring you to a point where you realize that you can use the magnet that's being pushed into this coil to generate a potential, right? A source where you're going to now use this potential to generate a magnetic field now, what happens is, okay, let's say the magnet is over here now. So on this side, you remove the counter EMF and you just have an open circuit, basically, right? You're just charging up the internal capacitance of this coil. When the magnet gets on this side, then you short this guy out across the load and you can generate electricity while, right, generating the same pole, which is going to push this magnet away. And uh, after a lot of thinking and a lot of other people uh, having discussions with me and, and all kinds of things along the way, in the last couple of weeks I've just been really focusing on studying, looking at other people's um, work and what they've been kind of doing and what other people have been trying to express to me it finally all kind of came into my head and I realized now that this is a possibility. And I also realized that Newman's original work was probably this very similar thing. Um, but possibly in a couple different configurations on his really large motors. Most people don't know this, but on his really large original motors, he had a really big heavy 5 gauge wire, 4,500 pounds on one of them. 4,500 pounds, okay? On the outside of that, he had 30 gauge, 300 pounds of 30 gauge. And he talks about this in his patent where you connect the outside coil to the inside coil in a, in a proper phasing at the right timing to actually advance the, uh, the system or you could draw power off that. And I really think that this similarity plays a role into what he was doing there. I really do. Um, it's hard to pinpoint exactly where that's happening and how that's happening because we don't have a lot of information. What we do know, okay, and I've talked about this in the past, my self-resonant frequency, okay, I can't even draw the curve right now because I didn't plan on drawing it, um, but it looks something like this, okay, and the curve here is this is um, inductive, uh, and, um, so on this side of the curve, uh, it acts more like an inductor. Once you get to a frequency, in this case, this is right around 120 hertz. Okay, During this portion, the coil acts more like a capacitor. And I've proven that. I have uh, the videos in the past, we posted those where I took the signal generator and I swept the coil, swept the coil in frequency. And when you got to a certain frequency, this is the frequency curve here going in that direction. So this is low hertz, this is high hertz. Inductively, we get this here at the low frequency as an inductor. It reacts more like a inductor. But here, once we get past the self-resonant frequency, we act more like a capacitor. Okay. And then on this side, when you go past that, this actually changes back to an inductor, past this frequency point here. I don't know what this is. Uh, that is a great question mark. I don't know what frequency that is for this coil because I have went up into the megahertz range and things get squirrely and it's really hard to measure, but I haven't worried too much about where this was because I'm playing with low frequency. So 
it's interesting. There's a lot of reports by Roger Hastings, and he clearly states that a lot of Newman's devices ran right around this self-resonant frequency, which means he was balancing between these two. He was right in this window of opportunity where in one instant it could act like this and the next instant it could act like this right so this is a high impedance over here and this is a lower impedance over here and if he was doing it at the right timing he could generate this effect using just a coil okay using just a coil that's a real possibility that he could have done uh, but unfortunately we don't have tremendous amounts of pictures and stuff that we can really reference and so we can only uh, assume that this is a similar principle to what he was achieving um, in his system by timing everything right. So now what I'd like to show you is charging up the coil like a capacitor. So I'm going to take the two windings just like this and I will draw the circuit diagram for you before we get started. And I'm going to spin the big magnet on the inside and it's, it's going to rotate almost completely free. There'll be a tiny little bit of, of friction but very very little. Once it's charged, okay, I'm going to short out the coil across itself and it's going to generate a magnetic field while discharging. Now in my case, these two are sort of hurting each other in this configuration. I think it's probably a lot better by filer, but in this configuration I've just got one big coil on top of the other big coil. That's my capacitance. It's probably pretty small, so there's not a whole lot of things and don't forget whenever I short this coil out, it won't go very far because I still have that resistance problem, right? I'm shorting the two coils out and it's generating a problem. If you short this winding to this winding or this winding to this winding or wherever, it depends on how you short it, okay? You can do different things. I will also show you that we can charge up the coil with a battery. While it's charging, it'll generate a magnetic field. Once it's done charging, it will hold that charge for a certain amount of time. It will decline because it must have a lot of internal resistance or something. Um, but it will decline. It won't hold that charge really well. And then we can discharge that. So I can charge the coil like a capacitor and then take the batteries off and then discharge the coil across itself and generate a rotation. So that means that I can achieve this goal if timed right. Unfortunately, this coil is configured wrong for this exact scenario. Don't forget, this coil was designed, built, and constructed for a high frequency, um, you know, talking about the RF and coupling, having a, a capacitor coupled like this to ground, which it was, because he talks about attaching a wire to the magnet and to the outside. I put a shield on mine and tested some of these things, but I didn't get the result I was looking for, unfortunately. But um, there's a whole bunch of different similar scenarios that happen to reference to an outside source. Um, so let's go ahead and we'll do the demo right now and hopefully you'll like it. Okay, so um, let me show you a circuit diagram so you can see what we got. So we've got uh, the battery, it's about 300 volts. You can actually see it right there, it's 294. We've got a pair of, uh, well, we've, then we've got the voltmeter across the batteries right here. So this is the yellow trace. It's just right across the batteries. Then there's a bank of relays, which are actually, ask, which are reacting or acting as a switch, which they are. Um, and so that's his A on my diagram. Then you've got, it goes up to the coil, right? Then they're connected just like in the diagram there. Then they go back down to B, which is another switch. Um, I have the purple trace. Channel 3, I have it right here. Um, so you can see it's across the other side of the coil. So we can see, you know, as the voltage goes through the coil, we can actually measure it over here. And then we've just got a short across the other side. And these are on um, relay banks. So I'm just going to turn on the one I want. The yellow one here is A, the purple one here is B. <clears throat> I got the ground already connected to this little 12 volt battery which you probably cannot see. I'll move it in here so you can see it a little better. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to charge this coil like a capacitor. That's exactly what we're going to do. So watch what happens. Okay. We're going to uh, pay attention to the oscilloscope screen. Uh, right now the zero line is actually right here. I've moved everything down so that we can see what's going on. 
Uh, if I remove the yellow lead, you can see it'll drop down to the same position. Plug it back in, it goes back up. So, uh, so here we go. I'm going to basically charge this coil like a capacitor. And you can see it will discharge slowly on its own. So the yellow one first. There it is charged. When I release that wire, you can see it slowly discharges. And it actually won't go all the way down to zero. It'll kind of hover down there. And that's the place where there's a lot less uh, resistance. There must be some decent amount of resistance inside this thing uh, from wire to wire somehow. And then if I short it out, we'll bring it back down to zero. I'm going to do it again. Just a moment, I short it out a little faster. I tapped it there too many times. Okay, so you can see I can bring it back up and charge it back up, or I can discharge it and bring it down to zero. Now, if I let it go, look at that. Just like a normal capacitor, it bounces back up. It's slightly polarized. So the dielectric material that's being charged here is the air in between, which is good, which could be uh, the space in between, which is that could be why the uh, you can see it dissipating so fast. That might be just the space, but the little re residual right there that comes back up that's most likely due to the um, the dielectric of the actual wire coating itself. Okay, and I can do this all day long. And you might ask, well, does it produce a magnetic field? Shining me with your UV light there, Womanator. You, you, your UV light's on, you're beaming me in the eyes. <laughs> She's looking for scorpions. Anyway, um, so there we go. Easy. So I'm literally charging this thing like a capacitor. Now, you might ask yourself, can you, can, you know, capture this energy back into another cap or something? Um, and yeah, you you definitely could. So if I put a uh, another cap on where this dead short is, I could just dump that right back into another space and reuse it. So now what I want to show you, okay, that's with no um, magnet in there. So let's just go ahead and put the magnet in there to show you that I am still producing a magnetic field. In fact, uh, I didn't record this, but... Um, I'm going to have to turn the voltages down now because now we're going to be inducing a voltage. We can measure that on the pink trace there. I think what I'll do is just turn this way down so we can see it. It's at 500 volts per division now. Um, so you can't see that. I want to move it for you. You don't really need to see what I'm doing down below, but I do want you to see what's happening up there. Maybe I can get Get it in there like that. Uh, what the heck, we'll just go up. So you can see it on the oscilloscope. Um, so what I want to show you is this does produce a magnetic field as this happens. And that's partly just due to my geometry of this coil. It's just massive. So let's watch what happens when I uh, discharge the coil. Okay, now I'm going to charge the coil. Okay, you saw the magnet move. Discharge. not much. That could be due to where it's located. If I put it like that, you know, we should really see it. Anyway, the point of this demonstration is to show you that even though we're charging this like a capacitor, we still have current flowing and we do still produce a small but a magnetic field. Um, that's something to just understand because of the geometry, that's what we get. So now what I want to do, I'll leave this in here actually. Now what I want to do is show you the other configuration where I can induce a charge into that capacitance that we just demonstrated we have in here. I can induce a voltage in there with this spinning magnet with almost, well, practically, I'll show you. There's like no drag hardly at all there at all. Um, but I can do that. Then I can discharge that across itself just like I showed you. So let's set that up. I'll show you what that diagram looks like in a second. All right, so uh, let me show you what the circuit diagram looks like. Um, we're basically we've got the two coils connected. Uh, they are going to my probe, the yellow trace there, 
and then we've got a relay which basically shorts out across one of the main coils, not the big coil, but uh, one of the main coils here by itself. Um, I just realized that uh, earlier I was discharging and I couldn't remember why. It's because this probe has a resistance and the resistance is what's draining my capacitance. So um, it stays a little bit better than what I showed you, but here you'll see if I take the probe off and I try to charge it and I put it back on, it'll kind of reset that problem. So anyway, um, what I want to do right now is actually disconnect the coil and show you that it spins nice and free. There's nothing on the oscilloscope. Now I'm going to connect the coil up, spin it again, and you can see it still spins nice and free. There is a tiny bit of resistance, I can feel it. But what you'll see on the oscilloscope is that I can charge the capacitor or the coil like a capacitor. Now I'm only able to do this using what I have and it keeps sparking across my, uh, my gap here so just ignore that. But you can see down here, look it's at over 600 volts. Um, if I switch this so I've got double the distance, I should be able to get it up to a little bit higher voltage here without it arcing over. Now, depending on where I stop this, if it's at the top of the cycle or the bottom of the cycle, it, it does sort of change how much is charged. But you can see there, uh, you know, I'm over a thousand volts. That's the internal capacitance. So what I'm going to do is when I get it charged, I'm going to short it like that. And you can see it moves all by itself. That was actually the discharge. So let me show you. Do you see that? So if I do it right, I can actually get it to It depends on which way, which way this is sitting. But you can kind of see it. Look at that. That was a really high voltage. I can, uh-oh, I can actually hear it. Uh, I can hear it arcing over. It's got such a high voltage charge in it, I can hear it hissing down here on the uh, on the relays. But anyway, the point is is to just demonstrate that you can charge this thing up with its own internal magnet and then discharge it and make it run. So if this was timed right, you could imagine that every quarter cycle you could charge this guy up and then discharge it into itself. And uh, while it's doing that, you could put a load on the other side and also dissipate some energy into a load at the same time, especially a low impedance uh, transformer or something that uh, could, could do the job. So anyway, there you go. Yes, indeed, you can. Let's go a little closer so you can really see that voltage. Look how high that is. So if I disconnect the probe, See where it used to be? Now if I reconnect it, you can see it's basically at the same spot. And that is literally because my probe is discharging. So let's, uh, let's see what we got here. Ready? Look at that. So it was over a thousand volts. So if I let it go and I leave it there for a second, you'll actually see it's bounce, it'll bounce back up, just like a normal cat. So if you look, this was actually a little higher than where I ended, which is pretty crazy. So if I take the uh, probe off, look at that. If I take the probe off and try this, it'll be a lot easier. Um, the reason I say that is because uh, I'm not dissipating, there you go, I'm not dissipating the energy into uh, something else. So that's just one, one of the coils. This is not fastened, by the way. <laughs> Careful now. Oh, 
might be trying to break it. Stay. It's got some torque. Okay, well that's the demo for today. Sorry if the video was really long, but the search for answers is all about showing you a principle and then trying to demonstrate it on the bench. Um, unfortunately, like I said, this coil's not a bifilar wound, so I'm kind of limited on what I can do. However, uh, the new build, right, the one with this big bearing and this big shaft and the, what did I say, 78, 78 magnets, I believe it was, um, they're in, um, thanks again to Richard. Richard has been sponsoring basically this because he is with me. We want to see this work. And what's interesting is on these other designs, instead of using a single conductor like a number 5 AWG like Newman did, what's interesting is he said that you could bundle wires together like a Litz wire. And he could, you could bundle those wires together and t until you got to the equivalent okay, of a 5 AWG wire and you could achieve the same result. And you have to question why in the world would he spend so much time wrapping bundles of wire together when you could actually uh, just wrap one wire. And so when you think about it, if you configured the coil in a bifiler fashion or a trifiler or even higher, and then configured it in a different way, or it'd be done sort of automatic depending on what frequency you're running at, um, I actually plan on doing it mechanically or some other means just because it's easier, I think, for uh, not worrying about frequency and stuff like this for now. But um, you know, why would you wrap, um, in my case, it'll be 20, 30 AWG wires. Why would you wrap them like that? Why wouldn't you just use a single wire? And so it, it makes sense to think like this on Newman's work. Um, I really think that it's the right path of viewing what he did in his original stuff. And one last thing I want to talk about, okay, if on this half or this uh, quarter of the cycle, you're producing a forward motion uh, because you're using the, um, the EMF to drive the magnet in a repulsive mode here on this part of the you know, quarter cycle. I'm splitting it like that. Um, if you had this magnet coming in with no resistance because this is like an open circuit, you're charging like a cap, and then you discharge this across itself while having a load out here, then you could potentially see a negative value on a meter reading this device. Because you have to ask yourself, how did Newman demonstrate, and he did this many times, um, how, and this is what I've been looking for in a lot of my videos, you've seen this, how does he produce a negative value while running this thing and producing a tremendous amount of torque? And if you think about it, if here you have no counter EMF, right? Remember, counter EMF and back EMF are different. If you have no counter EMF here, and you have back EMF in this system you could use to your potential, right? If you have no counter EMF here, but forward EMF here, okay, because you're, you're pushing the magnet away in this case, then you could actually generate power, real power output here while driving this forward. And you could consider driving this in reverse and creating a constant negative. There's one video where he has a constant negative value and I, it's been boggling me for a while and this makes sense on why that could be. So anyway, I hope you enjoy. God bless, read the Bible more. And I did make a video last week and I said in that video, if you actually got through it, thank you. The end had some other good stuff in it. You should watch the whole thing. But anyway, I said in that video, there's a verse, right? And the verse was talking about um, asking God what you need. Now, the, the important thing about that is the word need. Need. Not want. Need. Okay? My stories are all about what I need at the moment in life, not what I want at the moment in life. And that is why a lot of people get frustrated with me. And they're like, oh, it's a bunch of coincidences. I can go around and you hand select things out to make it sound better than it really is. And it's like, I could sit down and tell you 10 hours worth of things that happen that have no other reason except for those exact potentials. Okay. I have, you know, went down the path for things I want and you never get them. 
But when you need something, you can count on it. All right? Prayer is very powerful. God bless. Read the Bible more. I hope this was helpful. We'll see you another time. Yeah, yeah. I've been slacking a little bit, but not really. I've actually just been working so hard on my understanding that I haven't been able to make these videos as often as I'd like. So, Patreon, it's a thing if you'd like. I got my Bitcoin out there. And also, um, you can go straight to PayPal if you'd like. Just out there for people who want to help. No uh, obligations. Thanks for everybody for your uh, offering so far. I really appreciate it. God bless. Bye-bye. Hey, what's up, everybody? My name... <clears throat> I need a drink. That's not my name, but I do need a drink. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll try that again. <clears throat> I should put a drink over there. What am I doing? Nobody knows where she goes. Yes, I've lost my mind. Anyway, I'm back. I guess I need to put something right here. Like... Read the Bible more, right? Right there? Anyway. Oh, okay. I'll start over.